Good morning, right? I, I don't know if I can top the opening remarks, good morning, but uh, thanks for joining us for our first keynote. Machine learning on Kubernetes. And how Kubeflow made this process easy for us. I'm extremely excited to be here and share the game-changing experience I have had using Kubeflow in my day-to-day -day job as a lead data scientist at Shell. Kubeflow makes the machine learning process um, very easy for data scientists and machine learning engineers. And um, it's going to create uh, very efficient platforms for data scientists and machine learning engineers to collaborate, share ideas, and learn from their own projects and experiences. And finally, it's going to reduce the cost of uh, model building by managing the computational and storage resources efficiently. But before getting to that, I'm going to pass it to Jimmy so he can describe and give a brief uh, history of Kubeflow and its relationship to machine learning and data science. Back to you. Hi, my name is Jimmy and I run developer relations at Ricto. For those of you who may not be familiar with Ricto, Ricto was a key contributor to the Kubeflow 1.3 as well as the recently cut 1.4 release. Uh, despite uh, or besides participating in, couple, in a couple of the uh, Kubeflow working groups, they're also the primary maintainers of the MiniKF as well as the Kale projects plus EKF, which is the Enterprise uh, Kubeflow ML Ops platform. Now, I know that we're at KubeCon, so this is going to be a conference that's all about cloud native architectures, not necessarily data science or machine learning, which is to say that likely the majority of the audience or the viewers that are joining us uh, virtually are going to be cloud native developers or architects, not necessarily uh, MLOps practitioners or data scientists. So it's not going to hurt to spend just a minute to talk about why the combination of Kubernetes and machine learning are actually a match made in heaven, and here's why. First, containers allow us to create, test, and experiment with machine learning models on our laptops, and we know very well that we can take those same models to production using containers. The idea here is not new, right? We want to write once, reproduce, and run everywhere. Second, a machine learning workflow on our laptop may be written entirely in one language, let's just say Python. But when we take those models to production, we're probably going to want to interact with a variety of different services and applications. So these are going to be uh, things that are going to be doing data management, security, maybe front end visualizations, et cetera. And here, we're going to probably want to go with a microservices-based container architecture. Here again, Kubernetes is going to be uh, a slam dunk for us. Finally, machine learning loves GPUs, uh, but uh, GPUs are expensive, right? So it's not always about how quickly can we spin up uh, an environment and get access to all the resources that we need. In this case, it could be just as important how quickly we can spin down that environment. Uh, back down to zero. So here again, containers are going to be a perfect fit. Unfortunately, there's uh, an open secret in the, in, in the industry that um, not a lot of, or a, a lot of machine learning models are not being su successful in making it uh, to production. And the question is, why is this? Well, there's a combination of factors going on here that involves skills, uh, software, methodology, and the ability to efficiently uh, collaborate, right, in, in an organization. And uh, big organizations being what they are, right? So skills in the sense that we're often asking data scientists to be uh, Kubernetes experts, and we're asking Kubernetes experts to be data scientists. Therefore, finding the right uh, methodology, the right software, and perhaps a little bit of empathy right, that's going to be needed in order to collaborate across these teams and be successful can prove to be a little bit elusive. So what are we to do? Enter Kubeflow. Kubeflow is the open source project smack dab in the middle of this big convergence in IT. And here I'm talking specifically about the combined ubiquity of cloud native architectures and the needs of machine learning uh, workflows. As we know, Kubeflow was originally launched by Google back in 2017 and has since become the most robust, open source, cloud native by design, not as an afterthought, ML platform for data scientists as well as operations folks. It's a complete toolkit of components that allow both data scientists and operators to manage, train, model, and tune, and even monitor uh, their workflows. Now that I've said a little bit of context, uh, I'm going to hand it back over to Masood, who's going to walk us through part of Shell's data science and machine learning 
uh, journey so we can understand how Kubeflow and its ecosystem of integrations uh, helped solve many of the challenges that they were facing. Masood, over to you. Thank you. Most of you might know Shell as the old giant. However, in these recent years, Shell has expanded its focus and, and to other sources of energies, like green and renewable. And to that effort, actually, um, roughly spent um, $2 billion annually through 2020 for these kind of new resources. And expected to in, in, uh, expand these um, uh, like, you know, expenses to even more for uh, years to come. So, um, it, like, you know, it's, it's obvious stepping into these very, very um, um, large scales environment that you need to get your resources from different um, source of energy and distribute and transmit to users that are increasing day by day. And they have drastically um, different, uh, you know, uh, consumption patterns. Need a smart, very fast, agile um, control system. And without having um, uh, artificial intelligence at the scale, this is not going to be achievable. But having AI at Shell's scale can create some challenges, and our team at um, Shell faced some of these challenges. The first challenge that we had was creating a development environment, proper development environments for these kind of um, uh, um, problems. So as a data scientist, I used to work on the local environments, like you know, build some machine learning, simple machine learning models, and using the local data. Now we are going to use a large scale data set from the grids, from different countries, all around the US, Europe, and we want to build a model. So it's going to be extremely hard if you want to create an environment like that for to be you know, capable of doing some, uh, some modeling like that. Well, the second challenge, we want to uh, work in these environments. These environments require the specialized skills. Look, if you want to work on your local machine as a simple model, it's going to be really, really easy. But you want, when you want to go and grab these data set, you, let's say you want to forecast price, you want to create load consumption, you want to figure out weather, you want to figure out the generation, is the consistency in the grids, you need to have a graph of the, your network, and you need to combine and get the data. It's going to be extremely hard. And like in, now you want to run them on Kubernetes. This is great, but before that, you need to know about containers, you need to know about the, um, how to scale, you need to know about GPUs before even getting to the modeling. This can take a very, very long time, it's very challenging. And of course, the last part, we, want, we don't want to actually bankrupt our IT system. I'm a data scientist, I'm a very selfish person. I wish I could have all the GPUs around the world for me, dedicated to me, so I can work on it. But is it possible? I wish. Um, we cannot give any, a couple of GPUs to every data scientist. On top of that, Machine learning is a very spiky process. When you are in the in development environment, when your code is ready to be pro and it's in production, you just need a couple of CPUs to have it running. But when you are in the modeling phase, um, as I mentioned, that the problem is very uh, huge. So you need to have a very huge search space. You need to tune so many parameters, and you need to have a huge computational power. If you are in the uh, uh, in production environment and you have a huge computational power, you lose it, money because you don't need that. On the other hand, when you are in the modeling phase, you want to have a huge computational power because if you don't have it, you're going to lose money by wasting the expensive time of your data scientist. And now we want to see how Kubeflow actually help us to address all of these challenges. The first thing is gonna be the um, uh, Kubeflow actually creates a self-serving model for us. So you, uh, data scientists can go and grab computational power and storage, and they have um, pre-configured ML toolkits in that, in, that, is, that exist in the secure cloud environments. How cool is that? Now we can actually bring all of those things and do the machine learning projects like, easily you know, from minute zero. If you wanted to do that uh, like, you know, in the old fashion, so it could take weeks or even months. Now we can do it in just a couple of minutes. The second one, with having Kubeflow Automated Pipeline Engine or say, uh, um, KLS CK, we are going to fill in the gap between the data science and software engineering and ML ops. Now our data scientists are capable of using their simple code and, and bring it and pass it to the ML ops. So, and it makes the process much faster for us to uh, put the things into production. And finally, since we are using Kubernetes, we can smartly manage our computational and storage resources. Um, for example, we can uh, monitor our um, as, uh, notebook servers, how they're using our computational power. And if, they're, if they don't need it, we are going to release those and put it in the pool so some others can use it. Um, if we monitor our um, uh, notebook server, as, as I mentioned, so if they are sitting idle for more than 24 hours, we are going to create a snapshot. 
and we are going to release the resources. And if the data scientists need to use that um, uh, old uh, server, it's going to use the um, snapshot. And it's going to start working where he or she stopped earlier. Now I'm going to give you a demo how easy it is to run, um, uh, launch a notebook server in the Kubeflow UI. So first thing, we need to create a new server. We just need to give a name, let's say KubeCon. And you can see we have Jupyter Notebook environment, we have Visual Studio, R Studio. And, and if you remember, I mentioned we have a different ML toolkits, pre-configured ML toolkits. We have something for uh, deep learning, different version of TensorFlow, PyTorch, we have something for Spark, we have GPU version of that. And if there is something that doesn't exist here, it's easy to actually bring it up here for other applications. After that, with some simple configuration, we are ready to go. We just need to say how many CPUs I need, how much memory I need to have for my uh, server, and if I need GPU or not. For example, here I just I don't need GPU for the simplicity. And after that, I'm go just going to say how much storage hard I need for um, um, my notebook server. And it's, I'm going to skip, like you know, for the simplicity, for the, uh, some other configuration, and we are ready to go. Just click on this beautiful launch button, and you're going to see my um, notebook server is going to start in a couple of seconds, which could take me like a couple of months, you know, without having these things. Now we are ready to connect, and as you can see, I just need to have a web browser and a secure internet connection. Now I am in my server. I have Visual Studio, I have Jupyter Lab, and um, now, if you go, you go to the Jupyter Lab, you're going to see it's very similar to our uh, lovely Jupyter Notebook. And, but there's something more to that. We, are, we have securely connected to AWS, and all of my data is located there. So I can bring and drag everything to my Jupyter Notebook, and I can start doing some data science and cool stuff from minute zero. I'm going to suffer a little bit in this graph, and I'm going to share the beauty I see in this graph. Um, for you, it just some, might be a very simple flow graph, but this graph was very, very uh, like, lovely to me. It gave me those, one of those aha moments when I saw it for the first time. I was super excited. When I joined Shell as a data scientist, my first assignment was to um, uh, build a predictive model. Uh, I needed to grab data from different sources. I needed to subsample them, and I needed to uh, use different model configuration. But I couldn't have a huge uh, search space because I was working locally. Long story short, it took me a month or two months actually to come up with a mo uh, the, uh, like in a model in the proof of concept and Jupyter format. I passed it to my coworker, and I said, can you productionize that? It took him a month to come up with a model, and the performance was not that great. I was lucky at that time to be acquainted to Aricto and Kubeflow. With the help of my coworker, we built the machine learning discipline, and we repeated the same experiment in just 35 days from uh, data processing to deployment and exponentially reduce the time in our second effort to a couple of days. Now in our team, we have some team members with basic programming skills that can apply cutting edge machine learning and deep learning in just a couple of hours. And the story doesn't end here. It get, get even simpler and better for data scientists. We data scientists love um, Jupyter no Jupyter Notebook. Now, we just grab this Jupyter Notebook, add some, ta add some tags to those cells, like import, um, pipeline, um, skip, and some others, and we can push a button and uh, create a pipeline from it. Kale is going to take over that um, uh, code for us and create a valid pipeline, and it's going to take care of all the data dependencies, and it's going to manage um, the life cycle of this Kubeflow pipeline. And of course, finally, snapshot policies allow us to release idle resources without losing any work. And this, ladies and gentlemen, was the game-changing experience I wanted to share with you as a data scientist at Shell, and how Kubeflow actually helped me to um, um, focus on my work and you know, avoid all of those distractions that I was always hesitating to touch that, so I could focus on my work and challenges that we have in a huge project that we have at Shell, and be productive and deliver the projects in a timely manner. Thanks, everyone, for attending, and enjoy the rest of the show.